We often think of the grand and noble achievements being made in developing green energy, advancing medical sciences, or improving diplomatic relations overseas. And I've asked myself frequently throughout the course of my music career, can a modest little fiddle tune change the world? That was an old Scottish-style fiddle tune meant to provide a lilting rhythm for folk dancing. I once played that tune at a performance in Idaho, and I was out in the lobby afterwards signing CDs, and two little girls ran over to me and said, Mommy, Mommy, take our picture with the leprechaun. <laughs> <laughs> a tune like this is sweet and noble enough in its own right, but obviously it's no Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. It hasn't the sweeping epic scope of a Hollywood movie soundtrack, and I doubt very much it'll hit the top 40 on the pop charts next week. But what makes this tune meaningful and special is the simple act of playing it touches so many people in the process. It sets the stage for fostering a rich number of personal interconnections and actually stimulates social movement. And today I'm going to share with you how that can happen. I was originally a symphony musician and an all-around music generalist before deciding to devote myself exclusively to Celtic music. I studied classical violin at the Victoria Conservatory of Music, which was in this magnificent castle with turrets and balconies, dark oak-lined corridors. It was like Harry Potter's Hogwarts school. Then I went on to play professionally in numerous orchestras and appeared on many movie soundtracks. I also played gypsy jazz and was an entertainer aboard cruise ships, and I played at Bill Gates' house. Once I even gave a private performance for Her Majesty the Queen. <laughs> and then I caught the fiddle bug. It was during a summer music gig in the Canadian Rockies playing Schubert and Brahms. And on the weekends, we'd go out to the barn dances, which was a step into a whole different world altogether. Cowboy boots, cowboy hats, gingham skirts, yee-haw! <laughs> and at first I didn't realize there are different types of fiddle music. All I knew is I was just mesmerized by the infectious rhythm, which is something you don't really get to do when you're a classical musician, you know, because you're in the orchestra, and if you tap your foot, you get fired. <laughs> but then as I got deeper into fiddle music, I realized there are all these different styles and traditions. There's Appalachian and Irish, Cape Breton, Breton, Cajun, Quebecois, bluegrass, etc. And for whatever reason, I was just always most drawn to the music of the Scottish Highlands, something about its ancient, haunting tonality, just resonates with my soul.
Well, in spite of my love affair with Celtic music, I was kind of a closet fiddler for a long time. Here I am in the symphony in my white tie and tails, obligingly playing whatever style of music was the order of the day, scrupulously following the conductor's beat, and of course, never tapping my foot. <laughs> from the stage, I would gaze out into the concert hall as if peering from behind an anonymous mask. It felt like there was a concrete wall separating performer from listener. And I remember thinking to myself, there must be a better and more interactive way of engaging with the audience. So finally, I just decided to throw caution to the wind, take a leap of faith or a vow of poverty, as the case may be, <laughs> and bid farewell to symphony life altogether so I could focus exclusively on Scottish fiddle music. And I know my colleagues must have thought I was just half-crocked for willfully walking away from the steady job with the symphony and choosing to wear a little skirt. <laughs> How do you like the kilt, by the way? Is that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. People always ask about this, so I'll just explain. This is called a sporn, and it's basically a man bag. It was invented 600 years ago for carrying cell phones. <laughs> I always have to remember to turn off the ringer right before the show, so I put it on vibrate. <laughs> Please don't call me during the middle of the show. It's a rather stimulating distraction. <laughs> Well, it turns out that pursuing a path with such a niche focus has actually helped connect me with a much wider audience and be able to instigate more action within the community than ever before. And that may sound like a bit of a paradox, going from a broad focus to a narrow focus in order to become more universal. But once you've found your own unique voice and begin sharing it with others, releasing it into the world like a flutter of butterflies, People respond to your passion. They engage with you. They go with you. They take an interest in helping you realize your dreams. And then once they're engaged with you, then you can get them engaged with each other, working together to create, to build, to grow things, to nurture. So here's how it all starts to come together. The minute I book a concert date, the gears start turning. There's this wonderful synergy begins to develop as local businesses become sponsors, newspapers and magazines run feature articles, radio stations invite me for interviews, and advertisers get extra coverage. Meanwhile, the venue is abuzz, hiring lighting and technical crew, conscripting volunteers, and hanging paintings in the lobby for sale by local artists. The print shop down the road is um, printing posters and programs. There's a pre-concert lecture by a notable scholar before the show, and often a big jam session breaks out afterward. Then kids add some extra magic to the mix. I like to pull in young dancers from the local dance school, and they get all excited about being in a professional show, so they practice like crazy and take extra lessons. And their parents get involved, too, sewing costumes and decorating the stage and uh, calling their friends, hey, my kid has this cool show, come on down. Often I'll include some young advanced music students to do an opening set, and uh, I have a group that I've brought in frequently called Cracked Up, and <laughs> they play Irish music, and they're charming and fun, and I, I promise you that nothing motivates a kid more to really like focus and, and accomplish something then the prospect of a performance. Then about a week before the show, I'll go out to the local public schools, and this is where I have a chance to get the kids talking about finding their own unique voice. You know, turn off the TV, get off the internet, just totally immerse yourself in whatever it is that interests you the most, and the world opens up to you. Then I really grab their attention and, and uh, earn their respect when I start playing a fast tune. They love these fast tunes.
sure glad I don't have to worry anymore about being fired for tapping my foot, or I'd be in deep doo-doo. <laughs> so before the show even starts, already there's this huge web of personal interconnections that's been built up. And then the moment we've all been waiting for, da da da, -da the downbeat, or the backbeat, as we say in the biz. <laughs> The show is filled with soaring melodies and toe-tapping rhythms. I try to take people out of their daily rat race and get them involved and engaged, not only in the music, but with each other. Meeting, talking, laughing, discussing. And invariably, they walk out of the concert hall in a happy, contented frame of mind, which definitely rubs off onto others. So it goes way beyond just uh, my standing on stage. As a matter of fact, we may never know the full extent to which we can change and touch someone with our little fiddle tune until something like this happens. This is an email that I received two or three weeks ago from somebody out of the blue. I've never even met this person. He says, Dear Mr. Laval, I saw you perform a couple of years ago in Seattle. Recently, I started a very difficult job in which I am personally insulted over the phone for much of my time on the clock. As new anxieties of adult life are popping up daily, your music has been an enlightened and transcendent friend, an inspiration and a relaxation. Not long ago, I was an overnight guest at a, a home of a friend of mine down in Georgia who's a surgeon. And we were sitting around his library sipping mint juleps after the performance that I had just given. And he said something to me very surprising. He said, Jamie, I so envy you and your music career. Well, this gave me pause for a minute as I'm glancing around his beautiful, glamorous home and thinking of the creature comforts that one gives up being an artist. <laughs> But he went on, he said, When I'm in surgery, I can only operate on one person at a time, whereas you touch multitudes with every one of your performances. So here's what I've learned, whether by scalpel or by fiddle bow. It's the cumulative result of engaging with people within an environment of beauty and generosity that always makes a long-lasting and far-reaching impact. That's how something as modest as a little fiddle tune can change the world. 